Assalamu alaikum. So I think we're about ready here to get started. Um, I have been so eagerly anticipating this evening for months. Like many of you, I recognize that this opportunity to hear our speaker in person tonight is a rare and extremely valuable opportunity. He is one of Silicon Valley's most innovative entrepreneurs, has extensive background in the development and pioneering of streaming technology. He built his first computer in the fourth grade and started the first computer software company while he was in high school. In 1995, he built Freeview, a low bitrate video conferencing system for the internet, resulting in the acquisition of his company by Real Networks. For three and a half years, he served as Real Networks Vice President and CTO, where he was responsible for the development and launch of Real Video. In 1999, he returned to San Francisco to start Linden Lab and begin the work that would become the virtual world known as Second Life. Even though he may not admit this to you, Second Life has changed the world and the lives of many. People with the use of one finger are given back life in the virtual world. And you don't even need to go to the planet Pandora. As we know, this soldier, the story of a soldier with a, bra a broken back was able to uh, save the world as an avatar. Today, there are many avatar heroes and many more to come in what I describe as a virtual country with a larger GDP and population than several real ones. Most recently, he continued his vision enabling nomadic workers using coffee and power. Prepare to be inspired motivated and more importantly equipped to live the life you've always wanted and I don't want to waste another moment of his time so please give an energetic welcome to our speaker for the evening Philip Rosedale thank you very much first First, I'd just like to, to say a huge thank you uh, to KAUST, uh, to the program here, and especially to my hosts, uh, Adele and Heba, uh, who have been so great, uh, giving me such a good time here. Uh, this is a part of the world that I've never come to before, and it's been an amazing opportunity. I'd always hoped that uh, there'd be a good chance to, to get here, and now I'm finally here. So that is just wonderful. So thank you. Uh, what, I th what, I, what I think I will do tonight is first I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my own kind of entrepreneurial life and background. I'll tell you something then about virtual worlds, about Second Life, about this, this strange, wonderful place and what's going to happen with it. And then uh, and I'll talk more about entrepreneurship and just some of the, the thoughts that I have about uh, making companies and about how th how they work and how things like to are probably going to change. I am uh, uh, naturally a kind of a crazy futuristic contrarian thinker, and so I guess what I promise you for the conversation tonight, before we get to the questions, I'm going to talk for a while and then we'll have uh, hopefully a bunch of time for questions. Uh, if I don't if I don't give you three you know, crazy things you've never heard before out of this presentation, I've let you down. And if you don't hopefully like, disagree or disbelieve at least one of them, I've probably let you down too. Um, the first thing I thought I'd talk about is just my own background. Uh, Adele mentioned making a computer when I was in fourth grade. You know, they say that these, these uh, and, and I believe that the people who have done amazing things, especially with computer technology, when you look back on it, it's often been more timing and opportunity for them, uh, or, or it has also been the timing and opportunity in addition to any kind of natural capabilities that they may have had. Uh, you know, Steve Gate, uh, 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 Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were born at just the right moment to be uh, young people just entering the, the career uh, time of their lives when computers were first around. Uh, that picture up there, those are four uh, computers that were 
four of my first. So when you look, when you look at my life experience, uh, I started kind of after computers showed up, where they were widely available, personal computers were available, but before the time of the internet. So I started my young, I uh, started my career quite young, electronics and programming when I was a little kid, and then uh, uh, more and more software and programming as computers became more and more available, you know, graduated from the Timex Sinclair <laughs> that I got for $20 at a swap meet up there in the corner to bigger and faster computers. And uh, in terms of timing, when I graduated from college, I studied physics in San Diego, and when I, when I graduated from college, I moved up to San Francisco, and just by wonderful fortune, moved my little uh, technology company right to San Francisco, right to the Caltrain station in South of Market, San Francisco, which was basically the epicenter of the consumer internet as we know it today. It was happening right there. And there I was as a young guy uh, with my own little company and an ability to do something, to do whatever I wanted, and, and there was the internet kind of laid out before me. So I think, I think timing is something that we, uh, we often don't consider enough the impact of. I, I don't think, I, I sometimes think like that, that perfect timing, being a computer software guy right at the beginning of the internet like that, right in San Francisco, I almost couldn't have screwed it up. Like you had to figure I'd go on to do something cool. Um, So what about computer? I want to tell you about what computer, what about computers really blew me away. Uh, this is a famous quote for those who have seen it from 2001, A Space Odyssey. And our, our astronaut, Dave Bowman, is looking into uh, the monolith and talking about and saying what he sees there. And as a young, so I, I started programming computers when I was young, but you know, everybody gets excited about something different, I think, in computers. And for me, what was exciting was the possibility uh, to create things inside computers that we had never seen before and to create a great many things inside computers. It was, it was I, I was taken from an early age by how uh, rich the world inside a computer could be. That, that picture up there, I love the laser pointer. This is super cool. I've never had one of these. Um, that's a fractal diagram. And I remember one of my own personal experiences that so moved me to do the kind of work that I did later. I was in, I think, 10th grade. And I was sitting with my buddy, Brock, and we were Zooming, there was these programs that will let you zoom in on those little details. So you can, you can take a little spot, like right there, and you can zoom the screen in on that little spot, and it redraws itself. Those mathematicians in the audience are, are perhaps bored by what I'm saying because they know it so well. You, you redraw these little sections of these beautiful pictures, and when you do that, you just find more and more little starfish and animals and things that you've never seen before. And you keep zooming and you keep zooming and these things just keep showing up. And I remember at one point my friend and I calculated that we had zoomed the computer in like 12 times and we calculated if we're looking at this 12 by 12 inch screen, how big is that original image that we started with? And we calculated it and we figured out that it was the surface of the earth. That was how big it was. And we were just looking at one little tile, you know, on a, on a picture that was now the size of the surface of the earth. If you did the math. And I remember, and then that, that background on the bottom is a thing called a Wolfram Automata, which basically generates complex structures all by itself. And when you watch these things run, you, I was so struck by the fact that there anything can be done in there. We can find and create just about anything inside these computers. So, so if you fast forward to that moment when I landed in San Francisco and was so taken by this birth of the internet moment, when I looked as a young computer programmer at the internet and I thought about those experiences that I'd had younger as a kid, 
what I was immediately struck by was this idea that, wow, if you could somehow connect together a lot of computers using the internet, you might be able to build what I guess I've, I've always described as kind of the world's biggest Lego kit. You, you'd be able to build something that was on the scale of a planet or planets or bigger, and then everybody in the world could get into that space, running some piece of software that I was hopefully going to build, and just make stuff. And as a kid, and as, a, as an entrepreneur, what I thought would be amazing and a, and a wonderful business and an amazing experience was the great question of if I, if I could build the world's biggest Lego kit, what's everybody going to make? What are they going to make if I make a space so big that everybody around the world can just log in and then start, you know, digging up the land and making buildings and trees and houses and you know, pretend restaurants and hotels and whatever they'd like. This picture is a picture from Second Life where you are actually able to uh, see to infinity, which for, for, for those people here who have used Second Life, you probably know you can't normally do. Uh, but it gives you an idea of that, that concept. It's always struck me as it's this idea of the vastness of it, you know, that, that, that there's something magical and different about creating a virtual world that is both created by people, not by a design team or a game team or something, but is created by everyone who's using it and is just incredibly huge. That, again, that, that sort of uh, magical experience to me was all around scale and how big you could make something like this. Um, you know, on the entrepreneurial side, I would just note that a lot of people when they, well, when Second Life became famous, well known, it was one of those great internet projects where people said, well, you know, who were the lucky uh, investors that jumped on that train early on and, you know, got to be part of your entrepreneurial ride here. One thing I would say about it is that I think there's a conventional wisdom that amazing things like this are sort of always venture funded. Well, Second Life is one of those things that was such a new idea, such a radical idea that it really actually wasn't really uh, venture funded. The, the, the company wouldn't have existed at all had I not had the uh, craziness to just put my own money, uh, a lot of my own money, a amount of money that was risky to me into the company myself and, and the first few years of work were paid for, a couple years of work were paid for by me and, and Second Life wouldn't have been around were it not for that. I wanted to say that because there are really I think a couple of different kinds of businesses entrepreneurially that you start. One is a business that sort of competes with things that already exist or seeks to address a customer pain or seeks to do something uh, faster or better than someone else can do it. And then there are the businesses like mine, <laughs> that are really out there, that are fundamentally trying to offer someone a new consumer experience that they've never had before. And those businesses entrepreneurially really go down in very different ways. And that latter type of business is often not one that you can venture finance. It's also not one you can plan for very well. It's not one that business school really prepares you for, I think, uh, a, a whole lot. Uh, it's just a tough, interesting thing. And that was really really what Second Life was. It was just such a new experience. Um, and, and, and being a mentor now to companies and, and looking back on the experience I had with Second Life, I'm really struck by that. And so I always want to, you know, really uh, give people the advice to give that thought. If you're, I, I think another thought about, uh, about ventures, you know, Second Life was something that I started not because I thought it could make money or I needed something to work on and it was the best possible choice after going through a rigorous selection process and consulting all my friends. Second Life was something that I couldn't get out of my head. It was something that I had wanted to do since I was a kid. And in fact, when I started that video conferencing company, which was the first thing I did in San Francisco when I arrived there, I actually told all my friends, well, you know, mark my words, I'm going to go build the Matrix. Uh, although actually that film hadn't come out yet, so I'm sure I didn't say that. I'm, I'm going to go build this crazy simulated 
computer world that we're all going to go into and never come back. And, uh, but, but what I said to them was, but as crazy as I am, I, I can't do it right now because computers are not fast enough, 3D was not good enough, uh, and the bandwidth isn't there yet to really do something like Second Life. And so I waited. And, and in 1999, when I started Second Life, left Real Networks, came back here to start Second Life, I, was, uh, I did it because right at that moment, graphics coprocessors uh, came out. They first came out in 1999. They had this amazing ability to do a lot of 3D on, on a card in every PC. And the second thing was that broadband became uh, a really viable option for the consumer internet. It was obvious in 1999 if you really read the tea leaves that broadband was going to go all the way. And, and I jumped and I ran and I, and I started this company and I, I, I gave little thought, I think, <laughs> to the risks around it and whether uh, it might be successful or not. So I, I think that I think that I think that projects uh, uh, like this often have these sort of you know strange qualities and timing. So I found this picture today. It's just beautiful. It's a, a screenshot from Second Life. Why build with bits? So I said before that I, the thing about the virtual world was I, had, I just had this dream. Why, you know, I wanted to see what people would build in a virtual world. But there was a really a bigger vision that I had around that, which I think stemmed partly from my own experiences in physics, studying physics. I was really struck by the thought that you know, the cities of the future, our, our own cities of the future, it would be so much easier if we could build them using bits rather than atoms. You know, atoms have sort of been around forever before us, and they're really hard to work with. There's, there, there's people here. Nanotechnology is one of the subject materials here. We're trying. We're getting better and better at moving atoms around and arranging them in ways like carbon nanotubes now and, you know, amazing ways that we can actually uh, move atoms around that we couldn't before. But the fact of the matter is building a city of that size takes a long time if you're doing it in the real world. But it could take a week or two in Second Life. I mean a city with not just that looks like that, like a movie backdrop, but I mean with all the, all the rooms in place and all the, all the lights and all the behavior and all the people living in the apartments and whatever. Stuff like that in the virtual world can happen at a vastly accelerated time scale. And in addition to that, an artist, an architect, we have two architects here who uh, have been teaching this week uh, how to use, how to, how to introducing the idea of science and architecture inside the virtual world to students here. Uh, artists and architects can realize their vision much more quickly uh, and, in a, and in a delightful, accessible way in a virtual world in a way that, you know, we really just cannot yet do in the real world. And I actually think that the progress of technology will so favor our migration into virtual worlds that it's likely that though we may gain more and more skill in sort of moving atoms around, I bet you that many of the things that we build with atoms in the real world today, we will never build again in the real world once we begin building them here. And that's a radical thought, but I really think uh, it's pretty likely. You might wonder, well, Philip, I've tried Second Life or I know what virtual worlds are like. I can imagine building a new city, a mega, you know, wonderful, amazing place to, to uh, explore in a virtual world, but I can't really, I can't really connect. I, I can't really see the people. You know, I, I, I can talk to people, but it's sort of like, it's better than talking on a cell phone, but it's not quite like being face to face. Well, I'll tell you, I've been thinking a lot about that and watching the technology and working on this technology over the years, and I think we will cross that gap. If you believe that we cannot transmit over the internet the experience of being face to face, you know, of really communicating with someone else, eye contact, body language, presence, the real sense of being there with them. 
If you think that we're not going to be able to technologically do that, I think you're making the wrong bet. And you'd have to be relying on, you know, something like the fact that, you know, the sense of smell or something is essential to the experience of, you know, talking to another person face to face. I don't think it's going to be true. I think instead we're going to figure out whatever it is that breaks us, whatever, whatever it is that separates us. And, and part of what's excited me so much about wor virtual worlds, by the way, has been ending the separation between people. Part of what's been so inspiring about them has been watching people from here and from everywhere in the world get into Second Life, millions of them, and get to know each other and get at least a little bit face-to-face -face better. If we bridge that gap of getting face-to-face -face and we can do it, over our computers in a virtual world, why will we build another great city on Earth? Why will we not build it there? I would, I would propose that it's at least important to think about that. Adele touched on Avatar, which is, well, you guess, which picture is from Avatar? Uh, you might also say that the richness of the real world, a jungle, for example, the richness of the real world, the organic beauty, the, the, the majesty of the real world will never be recaptured anywhere but in the real world. One of the ways that I think was really, is really fun to think about this, was I was inspired by seeing Avatar. I was inspired by looking at Avatar and thinking, the, the creators of Avatar could never have even begun to shoot that film by taking pictures in a real jungle and then overlaying or you know, putting the actors in them or adding some effects. The, the jungle of Pandora in Avatar is not a jungle that we will ever have on Earth. And it is one, well, we already have it in Avatar. There were about 40,000 machines used to render Avatar, but those machines can't do it yet in real time. Let me, you know, wait, I'll come back to that. But the, the Earth itself, the, the majestic complexity, the ecosystem, the, the, the biosphere of Earth is supported by light from the sun. And as you may know, about 1,000 watts of that light fall especially in a place here, like near the equator of the Earth, about 1,000 watts per square meter fall on the Earth uh, when the sun is out. And that's all the energy Earth gets. And so you can imagine a rainforest, and you can kind of imagine that each little one meter column of that rainforest is powered by that 1,000 watts. You know, that's like a hair dryer. That's all we get on Earth. And we're, I mean, and unless we come up with some real magic, we're not getting any more. But, of course, the jungle of Pandora can be simulated by billions of computers. Why do I say billions? Because we now have billions of computers online, in fact. There are all these wonderful devices. I've, I've, been, I've been delighted to see that uh, here, more so than at home, where home, home for me is San Francisco, uh, you guys have computer have have devices and computers here that are that are faster and even more connected uh, than ours. All of those computers put together make up an amount of processing of computation that is much more that that is capable of much more than that energy that we get from the surface of the Earth. So again, think about how crazy that is. That as we build the as we build the increasingly small, fast computers, what it means is that if you if you hook all those computers together and you give them the job of of simulating, of of thinking about what should happen next, so to speak, in a great digital jungle, what it means is that uh, as that becomes possible, we are going to be able to explore and see these these sort of natural wonders happening inside these completely digital worlds. The only reason you don't feel that way is kind of like the same reason you felt like computers didn't make a lot of sense. In that famous IBM quote, you know, there's going to be, you know, room in the world for maybe four computers. It's just because computers at this point are slow and we don't, we, we can't yet really grasp the inevitability of this. You know, as you know, every two years, roughly, I'm actually being charitable, it's, it's closer to a year and a half, we see 
the power of our computers double. And as this march continues, uh, well, one of, I said I'd come back to this. Uh, it is a kind of a well-known fact in computer gaming and 3D hardware that the time gap between what you see on a movie screen uh, as the best of 3D rendering, which Avatar was certainly an example of, the, the, the gap between what you see on the, computer, uh, the, the movie screen and what you can do live on your laptop is about seven years. So what that means is that from a virtual world's perspective, we are like about seven years, if people like me do their jobs, from having systems that will allow us to walk around in virtual reality in a jungle that looks like Pandora. And as I said, that, that is not a jungle that you will ever be able to explore on Earth. So let me talk a little bit now about uh, the avatar. I, I've always thought it was this wonderful, this magnificent separation. There's kind of the, the world around you when you're in a, a virtual world, and then there's you. And in fact, as a, as a young entrepreneur, when I started this, I didn't actually think about the you part of it. People always sort of came to me and they said, wow, this Second Life thing is this amazing social experiment, a uh, social experience, why, you know, you must have thought about social networks a lot, and was, isn't it amazing to build something like Facebook? And I, I kind of said to them, I was actually a shy, I, I, was, I was a shy kid who read a lot. I, I didn't actually have a whole lot to do with people. Uh, I was much more interested in computers and building things. And indeed, as Second Life started and, and took off, uh, I wanted avatars to be uh, adequately compelling. I, I wanted them to be uh, amazing. I wanted them to look like us. I, I wanted them to be delightful, and I wanted them to communicate as much uh, veracity, uh, communicate as much emotion and intention as they possibly could between us. But I was really blown away and learned a lot, and it was life-changing for me, actually, in my own work. I learned a lot about uh, people from watching people become avatars. And I'll tell you some things about that. You know, you, uh, you think about avatars, and, and if you've not gone into a virtual world, which I'm sure most of you probably haven't, uh, you, you, might, you might think of the idea of an avatar as being rather superficial. You might imagine that those people sort of... Uh, logging into the computer and turning themselves into little, you know, puppeteering, you know, these little virtual dolls, uh, are, are, that there's a lot lost in the translation, right? That they are probably not being themselves, that there's a shallowness to it. You know, you, you're, you're going to see, you know, everybody's either the, the this person or the that person. You're going to have this very stereotypical attributes and only a, a few basic sort of people that you encounter in the virtual world. That isn't true at all. That's not what happened at all. And it's really been interesting to look at. First of all, Second Life and virtual worlds are expansive. So if you are disabled, for example, you are able to live, in an, in, as we make the technology better, in an increasingly real way to live a real life again in these worlds. And it's not just physical disability. Think about something like autism or Asperger's, where there have been several published studies now done where, where people are able to, with those disabilities, are able to log into the virtual world and, again, l have the kind of social experiences that they basically cannot have in the real world and, in fact, improve uh, their lives in the real world uh, by, by using the virtual world to, to explore. The... Uh, the, the other thing about the avatar that's so delightful is it, it becomes this powerful exploration, actually, of your own identity. And this is a hard thing to explain, but it, you might you know, find it interesting to kind of meditate on. Because, it's so, because the virtual world is so plastic, and I mean that in a good sense, because it gives you the ability to change anything about yourself, it, it gives you the ability to design with your own hands if you want to, the tiniest little bits of jewelry or clothing or uh, the house that you live in or anything, um, all of those little changes become so easy and so delightful to do that you gradually are sort of drawn out. You express more and more of yourself in your avatar. People always think that the avatar may be a, 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 a man is a woman in Second Life or a woman is a man. Actually, when we studied that, that doesn't happen very much. And the reason it doesn't is because the sense of being an avatar in a, in, a, in a world that is as open as this is actually, it's hard to not be yourself. Really interesting. 
I remember times I've sort of put on other avatars, only a couple of times over all these years, and sort of tried to live with them for a little while. And it's this almost uh, strange feeling of isolation or whatever, where you just want to get back to who you were. So there's this powerful, powerful, uh, I guess, ability that we have as human beings to almost almost become more in some ways than we can in our, in our real skins as we enter virtual worlds. So think about that as well. Uh, in fact, I think that, uh, well, there are so many great stories. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell uh, all of them, but w one great story, and this has, been, uh, this has been written about, not this one, not one case, this has been broadly surveyed uh, uh, by multiple people now. Would you think using a virtual world, say, six hours a day, sitting in front of a computer, being logged into the virtual world, would you gain weight or lose weight? Actually, it turns out in a lot of cases you lose weight. And the reason for this, which is, increasing, which is a fascinating study, is that you tend to use the avatar, and, and there are other examples of this that aren't just avatars, as a kind of a target for your own intentions. It is what you wish to be. And so more and more, so you, the, the, and the avatar is so easy to change. You have so much control over your identity that inevitably what happens is you start toying with it over time. There was a fellow who told me this face to face and was telling me about how much weight he had lost a lot in Second Life. And he was telling me after all these years of just tweaking my avatar every day as a builder, you know, I'd, I'd sort of play with the way I looked. He said, I was just struck by the thought, could it be that hard to do this to my own body? Uh, so th there's this amazing uh, positive aspect of it where you actually can get healthier. That said, I, 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 I agree, and maybe we can talk about this in Q&A, th there is, uh, we do have to consider as a society the implications of being increasingly in front of a computer screen and not running around um, and, and what that's going to do to our health. Um, so that's second life. Let me, let me give you some other crazy things to think about. Uh, more related to work and some of the additional work that I've done now. And this is really entrepreneurship. This is a picture that my dad sent me a few months ago, and it was so funny. I want to put the laser. Boy, this is a great time to have a laser pointer. If you look right there, these beams right here, these lighter colored ones, my dad put those in six months ago. These beams right here, you'll notice, have a hole in them. And this is right about, this is my door. <laughs> so when I was in like 10th grade, I decided that the really way to be cool, the, the way to be really cool in high school to my friends, my perhaps misguided belief, was that what would be super cool would be if my door in my bedroom was like Star Trek and it went up and down rather than opening out. And being very handy with tools and stuff, I, I uh, was easily able to cut a hole through my ceiling and then slot through two, not one, but two of the large ceiling joists that held up my house. And I lived in San Diego where there are earthquakes, earthquake prone area. And uh, fortunately it was my mom I was living with at the time and not my dad. My dad now lives uh, back in the house. And uh, so I was able to fool my, my mom, I think, uh, who, was, who was less mechanical than my dad into letting me do this. But, the word risk is there because I, I think that I am one of those entrepreneurs who really does, w w at least with respect to projects and work and stuff, take kind of crazy outsized risks. I really, I really do delight in doing kind of nutty stuff and I think some of it comes from my childhood and just who I am. But I put that picture up there because I think that's real risk. And there are some crazy projects like Second Life that from an entrepreneurial perspective really are risky. I mean they really are crazy, crazy risks. But the reality is that though, uh, though many startups, all, all startups have a significant amount of risk in them, my belief after thinking about it, and this is what I want to talk about a little, is that really entrepreneurship and, and the, the way entrepreneurship can flourish in a community or in a city or not in Silicon Valley is not so much related to taking huge amounts of risk. It's actually related more to magically, as I'll explain, managing risk so that it's less frightening and less risky to start a company. And, cause I, and I think that's an interesting thing. because I've, I've traveled around the world and I've gotten a wonderful opportunity to explore and think about startups 
and entrepreneurship uh, in different cities, different cultures. And I've just been fascinated by this topic. And so this is what I, I want to give you my thoughts about it, kind of where I've gotten to with this. Now, what do I mean by this picture? If your startup is a lily pad and you're a frog, I have bad news for you. Um, this is the problem. Lily pads floating on water, easy to sink. The fact is, the most likely outcome for any startup is failure. It's actually quite likely that it will fail. And if it's a tech startup, and if it's a new consumer tech startup, it's really likely that it will fail. And guess what? Let me let you in on something. If you're, in, if you're financed by one of the best VCs in the world, Kleiner Perkins or Benchmark or one of those guys, actually, and the statistics are, around, are available to you on this, you still are probably going to fail. If you have somebody like me on your board of directors or, or on your founding team, you're probably going to fail. What was my other one? I have a note here. I had some. Any variable you want to change, best investors, Silicon Valley, co-founders, yeah, if you're famous, none of the, none of the factors matter. In fact, if, if, you have, if you have great people, if you have great people like me on your board or you have great investors behind you, what that probably means is that we think that in the unlikely chance that you're successful, you're going to make us more money than normal. So if you think about that, it's really funny. It's, it's simply that the great companies with the great leaders simply have a greater opportunity to return capital to their investors, but they still are almost certainly going to fail. So why, why would you, as a person, jump into something that was going to fail? And by the way, um, and this is the subject that I love so much, what, what I've concluded after talking to many different people in many different places is the key thing about getting entrepreneurship, getting startups happening in, uh, in a place other than Silicon Valley, is actually getting people's parents to not be afraid and encourage their children to engage in these startups. I mean your parents as prospective leaders of startups. Your parents in, in any culture, in any location, the big predictor of success is whether your parents can be comfortable with you uh, giving up whatever is perceived in that area as being a stable, safe job and doing a startup. And I think even what I'm going to tell you now, it, 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 if your parents kind of really don't want you to do it, you're probably not going to do it. And I think that has a huge impact on the world. And I don't entirely know how to fix it, but it's a really interesting observation. That is, only in sort of California and Boston and New York do you have these crazy, mostly American parents that are just like, sounds awesome. You know, if, you're, if you, you want to do a virtual world, nobody's ever done it before, it's probably going to fail. And you're going to spend a bunch of your own money to do it. Sounds great. Let us know. Send pictures. And that's not the attitude, obviously, that you have in the rest of the world, or, or mostly. The thing about a startup is, if you're on that sinking lily pad that has a 60% chance of sinking in the next 18 months, right? The question actually doesn't become how to make your company survive. You can't make the odds any better, I'm telling you. They don't get any better. The question is whether you have an alternative. That is to say, is there another lily pad you could jump to? And at what distance is it? So if there were a bunch of lily pads you could jump to, and each one is a company, and it's another company that will happily hire you to do the same job you're doing right now, then being a, an employee at a, or a founder at a risky startup isn't a big deal at all. And as these lily pads grow more and more dense, that gets more and more true. So I've done a lot of surveys and thinking about this. And one of the things I did with my team was we figured out how many people on LinkedIn list themselves as a technical founder or co-founder of a tech company per 100,000 people that live in these major cities. And, and we started looking at a lot of different cities. Look at New York, Omaha, Nebraska, where I gave a talk about this, and San Francisco. Look at that difference. It's, it, 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 it really, the graphic really shows it. That's downtown San Francisco. You can't walk into a, a, a coffee shop in downtown San Francisco without tripping over another tech entrepreneur doing a startup. They're everywhere. And this makes a huge, huge difference in the likelihood that you yourself will engage in a startup. And in fact, I went back and I, I, I took this analysis. I actually looked, and I'm going to say something about why I think this is actually under, this is a, probably an adversely low statistic. But I looked at uh, Saudi Arabia, 
and, and the United Arab Emirates in isolation to the extent that we could on LinkedIn. This data is from LinkedIn. We actually, as I said, we looked at how many people said they were technical founder, co-founder on LinkedIn. This is the number of people per 100,000. So again, this is a normalized number. And of course, in San Francisco, the, you know, the, great, the great home of technology, the number is 350 people. These next cities, if you can't read them, it's Seattle, Austin, Texas, Boston. Now, the first one to get out of the country here is Sydney, although there are probably some cities outside. But what you can see is this characteristic power law, what, is, what it's called in math, where you've got this rapid you have this rapid fall off and whenever you see these power laws uh, arise in things, in na typically in natural systems, it tells you something which is that the rich are getting richer is, is kind of a way of looking at it. Whenever you see distributions like this, it means that whatever is happening, well, if, if you're an entrepreneur here, you're going to be you're going to be a lot happier and more successful than one down here and so what happens is these these densities tend to grow. San Francisco didn't start here but it got there and it's going to stay there. So what's, what's happening is uh, you have this tremendous difference in, in, in density and it's density, uh, it's density and it's the sharing of information, collaboration and safety through all those different companies that you can work with that makes entrepreneuring safe, not somehow making the company itself safe. I was saying these numbers are probably too low. I think they are too low. Although, by the way, that means that there, if you, if you adjust that for population, it means that there would still be 280 people or so on LinkedIn in all of Saudi Arabia who uh, report as co-founders. And the question I would ask about that is, what would happen to the, the startup community if you could bring all of them across the entire country here and put them right here at KAUST and have them have access to each other and able to start companies together and able to uh, uh, solicit investment uh, from people and, and do the whole experience that they're doing all kind of within a hundred yards of each other so to speak and all sitting in the same room during the day. If they were willing to be collaborative with each other and if they were willing to help each other out you would then have an environment in which it wasn't dangerous and scary to start a company and that's the thing that I want you to think about and when you look at San Francisco you see both the result and the reason and, and demonstration of this power which is and I've traveled all around the world and seen this San Franciscans in particular do something with each other technologists do something that nobody else that I've found in the world yet does and that is they share information nobody has NDAs in San Francisco nobody uh, when you walk up to somebody in a coffee shop and they tell you, hey, I'm working on that too, they don't ask you to sign an NDA and they readily tell you what they're working on. Plus, there are all these meetups and get-togethers where people literally just sit and give away their trade secrets, tell you about what they're working on and what troubles they've had. And the thing is, this results in a benefit. It's a, it's a greater benefit than, a, than, a, than, than harm uh, to everyone involved. It's a net positive for the community. And so if you want to have a, a vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem, you want to do that. You want to basically get people to share information with each other, and you want to do that by reducing the safety, I mean, I'm sorry, by increasing the safety in the environment, which you do by getting all these startups to be very close to each other so that people have a lot of job opportunities. But this sharing of information is a killer advantage. And I've talked to people all over, and I've talked to tech entrepreneurs in New York and they'll sort of reluctantly admit it you know they'll say yeah you're totally right Philip we do not uh, we do not have the the strength that San Francisco has because people don't help each other in the same way the other thing I wanted to touch on and I think it's really salient looking at the community here and in a lot of other places as well it's not access to money or smart people or great investors that drives business uh, d drives the amazing uh, explosion of, of startups we see today. It's speed. If you actually here, if you here uh, uh, at KAUST wished to really grab a whole bunch of entrepreneurs from San Francisco and get them to actually, you know, migrate here, you know, show up, you know, not, not, not bringing them out here, but literally, you know, show up knocking on your door wanting to, to live around here and, and work here, what you need to do is outperform the speed that is already so amazing in San Francisco. You, when I say, when I, when I give those examples up there of do your prototype in a weekend, start your company in one day, 
A week later, you're, you're, you've got seed funding and you've signed the documents between your founders, you worked out all the stock ownership issues and everything, and in a month you launch the product. That's not an extraordinary case, that's on average. This is a picture of Y Combinator. Each one of these is a little group of people working on a project, okay? When those projects break down, if, they don't, if, if they're, what they're doing doesn't make sense, they're just gonna shift shares. Think of the speed that that gives them. So I think that the, 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 the richness of the ecosystem and the speed of innovation is driven more by, uh, or the, the, the success in innovation is driven more by speed. The world is becoming more chaotic. Technology is making things more confusing for us humans and our brains aren't getting any bigger. And what that means is that planning is less successful than speed because speed gives you the ability to try a lot of different options. And if you don't have, if, if, if you're not smart enough to figure out exactly what to do in the next week, the best thing to do is keep moving as fast as possible and try different alternatives. And that, 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 that factor, that concept of speed is so important. The other thing I just wanted to touch on for a second, and this has been something that I've personally been really passionate about. When I was starting Second Life, I was looking for how to manage the company. And I read this book called The Future of Work, and I've, I've, shown, this, I've, I've shown this slide a ton of times, and it's so interesting. I, I thought this book was so fascinating. It's a book that speaks to, uh, it's, it's a book written by Tom Malone at MIT, and it's a book about management in companies. And what he basically says is, he makes the observation that market systems, that, that marketplaces rather than, uh, uh, ra rather, rather than uh, 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 traditional uh, 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 kings or, or uh, structures, uh, uh, country structures in which everybody is uh, hierarchically uh, told what to do, he makes the point that companies, as it currently stands today, have a lot of the same internal structure that we had 500 years ago in doing things like deciding where crops would grow and where people would live in a country. And he makes the point that we went through this huge change to marketplace systems, to democracies, to uh, trusting people to basically organize these things for themselves. We did that in countries all over the world in almost every way uh, over the last couple hundred years, but we haven't yet done it inside companies. He made the argument that companies of the future, companies that are addressing these enormously complex problems are probably going to be increasingly uh, governed in a different way where there are also more marketplaces, more transparency and more uh, more trust and delegation to people than ever before and that there's probably going to be some sort of a market change as technology drives this to happen. So I kind of, I was really blown away by that when my own company, when Second Life was starting to grow and I was thinking what can I do and so I want to tell you some crazy experiments because like I say if I don't give you three crazy things you're not going to, I'm going to let you down. So the first thing I did in 2005 when we were about 50 people was I, I introduced this really interesting system where anyone in the company could send a message to anyone else in the company at any time, not your manager or your employee, but anybody in the company. So people sent me messages all the time, people that had just started, I didn't even know. Uh, anyone could send anybody else a message, one sentence, anything they wanted to say, hit a button, and it showed up in their email as this message of recognition from the other person. It also showed up on great big screens all over our walls. And it, in fact, became a part of the public uh, record of that employee. So everybody sending these little positive messages around about each other became this huge body of data that we all used to get smarter about what was going on inside the company. So we were able to see uh, what, what people were doing. Now, the point here was to build a system that increased transparency to a point where everyone was creating and consuming a lot of data every day about what was going on in the company and everybody had a pretty good idea about how everybody else was doing in much the same way that if you're playing on a sports team you kind of look out of the corner of your eyes and you see what other people are doing. I was super inspired by that and I went on doing work on that. And the last thing I want to uh, Talk to, well, I went, well, let me go back. I, w I went on doing work about maintaining this very strong, uh, substantial amount of transparency while we all worked together. And so the last thing I wanted to say, which I def definitely, I, I bet, will, will at least make you think. Then I, then I took on this question of how do we give people bonuses? How do we set their salaries? How do we divvy up stock options? How do we... You know, the, the traditional, I looked at the traditional process where as managers we, you know, kind of go in a star chamber and we sit down and decide what everybody, uh, how everybody's doing and we dole out 
stock or, 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 or salary changes or bonuses or whatever uh, commensurate with that. And I started looking at that and I said, wait a second, I'm into all these complex systems and simulation. Wouldn't it be true that if you actually had a lot of transparency in the organization using the tools I just described, that w why, not let, why not crowdsource this? Why not let everybody give out the stock options? What if everybody in the company acting together in some manner could give out the stock options and managers could be leaders and could be mentors and advisors to their teammates, I mean, I'm sorry, to their, to their employees, but they wouldn't have to actually set their, you know, uh, set their salaries. And if you think about it, of course, that, 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 that very uh, kind of dangerous relationship between manager and employee where they are both evaluating you, advising you, and setting your salary is a crazy one and it causes an enormous amount of friction and slows down to the point that I made earlier about speed slows down every startup fighting about who deserves what in a company is one of the biggest time wasters heck the, the technology is not even slowing us down that much anymore so I, I was I was crazy about this idea about how to do this and so the experiment I did inside Second Life and later now do with my own company and other companies that I've advised are beginning to adopt is this very simple idea where we basically believe it or not every quarter we split up all the stock options we want to hand out and we give an equal pool of stock options to every employee in the company regardless of rank regardless of role that's involved and then we give them 24 hours, 48 if you have a global company, as I did then, to allocate those stock options to everybody else they work with other than themselves anonymously. So you get to decide how to parcel out those shares to everybody else in the company knowing that they're all doing the same thing at the same time. And then by, by, adding, by adding all those allocations up, you get a graph. This is an example with my own company. This is real data from 2011. So this is the person who was deemed by everyone else to have performed best. And this is the last. And so we actually allow everyone to allocate those stock options and salary in that way. And that mechanism of crowdsourcing that, that incredibly fractious process has given us enormous agility as a team. We just smile and laugh about this all the time. The other thing you find with this process is that it correctly identifies the high performers. So if as a manager you worry, oh no, but wait a second, that one key person on our team without whom we'll be sunk isn't going to get compensated. Actually, they do. I've done this experiment. They get compensated at the same level that you know you could have essentially guessed at as the CEO written on a napkin and you know put in your pocket until after this process was over remarkably the crowd of all your employees correctly allocates those shares such a fascinating idea right but if you really think about it it isn't surprising at all because as I touched on earlier marketplace systems correctly allocate capital in in things like venture capital or or you know, deciding, you know, d deciding how, where to build shopping centers. I mean, these things work under conditions where you just let everybody decide effectively. And so this is a mechanism that, that, that is incredibly uh, interesting and empowering in a company. And uh, with that, um, I want to extend the conversation with some, some questions from everyone and, and talk a little bit. That's what I've got. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have three questions. The first one, uh, all of them are technical questions. The first one, uh, you said that is, uh, Second Life is uh, based on two parts, clients and server. So uh, we have more than one client, like Phoenix uh, client and so on. Uh, the client is, uh, is developed not, only, not necessarily by the companies who develop the Second Life. So, uh, I think this is an uh, open source project, so it's uh, published to, uh, to anyone who develops. But the server bro uh, source code, is it published? I mean, I can share it as a developer or uh, going inside the community. I'll uh, say, what I, so the, the, the question there is, on Second Life, we have both client and server software. Uh, we, we chose to open source the client software, and you were asking about the server software. The server software behind Second Life uh, in its current form is not 
is not open source. However, I do believe that the, uh, as virtual reality grows in its access and its importance, as more and more people are really conducting their daily lives in it, we will have to have open source at every level. I believe that the software behind virtual worlds needs to be exactly like the software behind the internet. It needs to all be open. Uh, it needs to be inspectable. The security needs to be as defensible uh, as, as we have with, with, with the internet today. Uh, the second question is, uh, what is the, uh, the technical challenges that you faced? I mean, uh, nowadays we have uh, uh, the client connect to the server, so we need internet co good internet connections and uh, good workstations working on the, the viewers to, to render the images. I think there's a couple of big technical challenges. Let me just throw out a couple and then you can find me afterwards and say hi and I tell you more. Uh, I think that uh, one of what we've seen in Second Life is that moving around and, and editing objects in a three-dimensional space, I believe it's an almost impossible problem with a mouse. But now we're starting to see all these amazing sensors that are built into the devices that we're using to, to compute with today. And I think there's a way to use the, the technology that's rolling out, like our phones and our iPads and all these devices, to, to do a better job of, of, of manipulating, of, of interacting with the virtual world. I also think those types of devices m may be able to help us with this face-to-face -face problem I was mentioning. But catch me more if you want uh, about that later. Uh, the last question is, uh, then according to your, uh, to what you have said, uh, in the future we're going to have a viewers based on the WebG, uh, WebGL and the HTML, full based in HTML, we're going to have a viewer on the mobile phone and uh, iPod device, tablet devices. So is this happening in the future? Uh, no, I, am, I am the chairman of Second Life, but not involved in the active day-to-day -day development of Second Life, so I, I can't make any statements about Second Life. Um, however, uh, I do think that WebGL and web-based uh, rendering technologies are, are promising, and we're ultimately going to be using them. And I think that it's definitely the case that we're going to have to look into virtual worlds on our mobile devices, because that's becoming, I mean, we're, we're gradually shifting to them completely. Thanks. Um, I have a question regarding Second Life and the people who use it now and may use it in the future. So um, obviously, it's, as you can say, it's not for everyone. Um, you have a lot of customers, I don't know the numbers. Um, but a lot of people are not interested. I'm wondering, do you think this percentage of people that find it attractive to use systems as Second Life is stable, for example, in a country that where everyone would have a computer and the possibility to use it, there would only be, I don't know, 5% uh, of people who would get an account. Would you think that is, would always be 5% or do you believe as you would introduce technology like make it more easy to communicate as in real life that that would rise? There's, it's a great question and I think that the percentage of people in a country, uh, uh, in, a, in, in a population, in any population that are using virtual worlds today, you're right, it's like 1%. It's very small. Uh, the reason for that, I believe, is, that is, is, is nothing to do with virtual worlds in and of themselves. I think virtual worlds will offer everyone here something that you will probably take advantage of day to day in another 10 years. The, the reason that the, the defense of that is, uh, I think the reason we have uh, such a specific set of use cases and a smaller audience today is that no matter what your reason for using Second Life is, and there's a ton of reasons today that are interesting, education, creativity, building things, meeting people. The problem though is that what they all have in common is that you have to be willing to commit, you know, dozens of hours to negotiating and learning the virtual world. Uh, to, to even be able to enter it. So just using Second Life as a view screen casually for looking at something in 3D, wandering the streets of, a, of, an, of an ancient city or something like that, we just can't do it today because as a casual user, let me tell you, you you're in for big trouble. I, I, I watched, I watched the, the, the wonderful uh, 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 guys that are, that are here today, uh, that, that are there, uh, 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 David and Britt um, teaching here and it is so challenging even when you're a total expert to quickly face to face even get people into Second Life it is such a difficult challenge and even when you're you know a, 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 a totally great evangelist of it and a great teacher it's hard to do but as that changes and as the amount of time it takes to get into the world goes down 
we're just going to fill in the gap. It was the same way with the internet. It used to be hard to get on the internet and the use cases were more narrow uh, because you had to have, oh, you had to be on a mission. I credit David back there with saying this was, you have to be on a mission to, uh, of some kind to, to get into the virtual world today because it's so much time. Um, so thank you very much. I have uh, two questions as well. So the first one is that you have mentioned the similarities of Afenda and uh, individuals in reality, in personality and identities. So how do you see the dif differences and similarities in social structures or economics in virtual world and the reality? So you're saying, say that again, how do we see, are we looking for the same like, social... I mean, like, have you observed some similarities or differences in something like so uh, social structures? The big, that's a great question. So what, what, have, I, what have we observed uh, exactly in the emerging virtual world that is different than the real world? Uh, a lot, a lot. One thing that's really inspiring and that really keeps me getting up in the morning and working on this stuff, and I, I think always will, is that with a lot of transparency, people are inherently good. Uh, that is to say, people's behavior to each other in virtual worlds, because virtual worlds tend to kind of put everybody's cards on the table, people's behavior is remarkably good. People are remarkably altruistic and compassionate and understanding. When they have differences of opinions, if they're able to be face to face in the virtual world, they tend to quickly resolve them. By the way, I think that's true in the real world too, getting face to face. It's just that sadly the real world doesn't let us all get face to face. We don't get to get face to face. You know, people in North America don't get to be face to face with people here very often because it's a 15 hour plane flight. So uh, I think that when you do see people sort of put together in the virtual world, you see this really inspiring set of behaviors. There's a ton of other things. I mean, economic systems tend to be remarkably stable as open markets. I mean, it makes me more of a believer in open market economic systems, you know, kind of a, from a macroeconomic perspective, the stability of the Linden dollar, uh, even for the modest GDP of Second Life, is remarkable. It's been more stable than the, I remember looking at the Linden dollar for like a two year period, it was much more stable than the US dollar against the yen. Now those are two big currencies. And the Linden dollar was actually more stable, you know, percent fluctuation over that period. So you see a lot of things like that. Thank you. And another question is, how do you foresee the future to use the Second Life or some similar system to, to attract people collaboratively to solve some real world problems? Well, I think we've already started to see some wonderful examples of that inside Second Life. We've got. Uh, We've got people co-designing a lot of things. Uh, uh, there are uh, great studies where architecture and urban planning and space development have been done uh, by people collectively in, in the virtual world that it just would have never happened that way in the real world because in the virtual world they do have these tools to explore and build things together. So I, 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 def I mean, obviously I'm biased and I'm very positive about this, but I think that the the collective, uh, collective social action will be much enabled by the virtual world. Great, thank you. Hello, um, I would have a question regarding the realism of uh, artificial worlds. Uh, you said there's about a seven year delay between what we get in movies and theaters, what we get in computers. But uh, I mean, other than graphics, how long do you think it will take before we get a artificial worlds with like trees that grow according to their own personal pattern, with rivers that erode, and all natural evolutive phenomena that are not determined in advance? I think the, the answer is hopefully faster than we think, and it's what I spend a lot of time thinking about. My background and passion is in s simulation and physics. Um, the question was, you know, how, 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 how long until the trees grow the right way in the virtual world in a way that's really compelling? And actually, actually, I think the problem of complex simulation in virtual reality is actually, strangely enough, uh, not really that hard. Uh, I, I do think that there's artificial intelligence and animals and, and us and you know, kind of really advanced forms of cognition that we're going to start seeing in the virtual world that is going to be a little farther to come, but, but actually I think you're going to be surprised. Uh, the, oh, the other thing is, go, going back to my slide, 
remember that I said billions, there's billions of connected machines. If, if, you, if you look at Second Life today, it's quite remarkable as a system. It's quite large. It doesn't have the detail of the real world, but it is quite big, and it has a lot of simulation going on in it, and it's 40,000 machines. As I said earlier, we've got a billion you know, plus connected devices, and of course they're multiplying very quickly. The collective computing power of all those devices is, is just, you know, it's just ridiculously larger than even what we have in something like Second Life today. So my, my, own, my own gut feeling is you're going to be blown away. Like I, I think that if we could just reach out and get a reasonably large pool, you know, a million connected devices to show us what could happen in a virtual world, I think we'd all be totally floored. I mean, remember that the best video games today are just amazing, and they're running on one, you know, they're running on one endpoint. You know, all that simulation is happening on your machine. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, I have one question here, here, here. Is this last? Next one, last. Okay. okay. I have one question and a comment. First, according that the people are good in Second Life, I think it's just because you only see a small amount of the total population of the world, and with this small amount is comparatively good educated, right? And uh, the question: How free is um, second life. So, how do you, how much do you allow the people to, for example, control other peoples? Do you have uh, religion? Do you have crime? Do you have, how restricted is it? Well, let me answer the first question first. I, I respectfully, I would just say that I disagree with you. I know that there is a, only a small cross section of people in second life today. But if you go in there and talk to them, and you can read studies about this, they're extraordinarily diverse in their intentions. Are there, are there, are there people with bad intentions in Second Life today? Oh, yes. <laughs> and I've, I've, had to, I've had to wrangle with them as the CEO of the company many times. There are people there uh, that, are, that are every bit as malicious as, as those we find in the real world. But it is still true that uh, with conditions of high transparency, there tends to be remarkably good behavior. To the second question, Second Life by its nature, by its development, by the very nature of the internet, I think, has tended to be very open. And so it tends to be uh, a, a very, very sort of unconstricted uh, environment with respect to, as you say, any kind of high-level controls. Again, though, I think that is inevitable because like the internet itself, virtual worlds in their final incarnation are likely to be sort of internet protocols which are owned by no one, which are shared by the world and which are developed jointly and you know typically uh, uh, the high, high degree of control uh, doesn't naturally happen in those systems. And I think, is that, is that last? I have one more question if, if that's okay. Last, last question? Okay, okay great. Yes. Uh, first, thanks for the great talk. Uh, my question is, uh, do you have any views on how virtual worlds would change politics in the future? For instance, uh, one example that came to my mind is how um, a, a country is determined to be superior than another is, for example, the strength of the army, economics, how would that apply in virtual worlds? You know, I, I, I don't think about it that much, but I, I think the most important thing to be said about virtual worlds is, well, first of all, I think they already are. I mean, our world is being changed immensely by communication. You, you know, text messaging is perhaps the most pervasive form of global communication that, that, that has, I think, impacted uh, politics. I mean, uh, it's been amazing to see how, how it's changed the world. I mean, as, a, as somebody in San Francisco, it's been amazing to watch how, how we talk about, you know, elections and whatnot. Uh, I think the other thing, though, is, is that the, the big statement is simply that I, I can't say, and I'm not a political scientist, I can't say exactly, I don't think anybody can say how it will shape the world, but what can be said is that these systems will uh, give us more and more ways to express ourselves very broadly and very rapidly to each other. I, I think that virtual worlds are in some sense, in some analysis, a communication medium and uh, one that has a, a set of attributes that we do not currently have today. Today, we have text messaging and email, and we have a little bit of voice and a little bit of streaming. I think the virtual world will kind of just, con I guess, continue to open that pipe up between everyone. And I think there is no one, I think, that has really thought deeply about the subject that would argue that that wasn't, uh, in the aggregate, uh, a good thing. And that's certainly what we've seen, too, with Second Life. So that's... Uh, 
Yet. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I encourage everyone, um, if you haven't given a chance to go into the virtual world, to really uh, go in and try it out. Um, if you've ever wanted to own a mansion or drive a Ferrari, uh, it can be done at a much uh, less expensive rate. And Philip, uh, we'd like to, uh, uh, as part of the KAUST and the WEP team, thank you very much for uh, the gift. Thank you.